play a little music, I'll do an intro. Here we go. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. It is Kevin Olenek. Of course, you can find me on Facebook, uh, like Agree or Disagree, the podcast on Facebook. You can add me as a friend on Facebook. You can go to SoundCloud.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, Spreaker.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, uh, Twitter, you can follow me at K-E-V-O-L-E, Instagram, K-E-V-O-L-E, Patreon, if you want. K-E-V-O-L-E, and subscribe on YouTube, Kevin Olenek. We are the controversial podcast that encourages people to think differently about their community. And we are here in Vancouver, of course, and October 18th, 2018, we'll begin a new era in Metro Vancouver politics. If you remember back on January of this year, Mayor Gregor Robertson announced his intention to not run for re-election. By the way, interestingly enough, his seat is one of half of the 21 mayor seats that could be vacant when we go into the election year. Robertson has been mayor since 2008, and there has been, of course, debate on his legacy he has left here. As an example, he did make a pledge to end homelessness in 2015. That hasn't happened. Some people feel that the city is more expensive than ever. There's a major opioid crisis and some have perceived that he was in the pocket of big developers. But he also has his admirers, his greenest initiatives, his opposition to Kinder Morgan, and his fight for improved housing options. We can debate uh, Robertson for years to come, but we are now in the time to replace him. And who will do it? Some have considered, some have not. Names like Bruce Allen, George Affleck, Chandra Herbert have publicly apparently said no to running for mayor so far. And there is a perception out there, which we will dig into as we get into this conversation, that no one actually wants this job. But there are actually people throwing their hat in the ring to become the mayor of Vancouver. And one of them is Brett Mullins. He is a father of two amazing kids, husband to a beautiful wife, and a project manager for PHSA Healthcare, he will never stop fighting for the better of the people. You can follow him at Brett A. Mullins. And his website, make sure I have this right, is www.yourvan.ca. How's it going? Good. Yeah, that's correct. It's yourvan.ca. Uh, our provincial party is yourbc.ca. Yourbc.ca. That's right. Yeah. So we're uh, going to the municipal um, area as well just to expand ourselves. And um what fitting way to go with your van on CN and hopefully we get uh, your Burnaby and so on and so forth. So. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Cause there's going to be, sounds like we're in a, well, we'll get into this, but we, we feel like we're in a new era here in, in, in Metro Vancouver, but tell us a little bit, let's start about yourself. Why are you getting involved? And maybe for those of us who don't know who you may be as, as well, uh, tell us a bit about your background and, yeah, I'm I'm an Ontario and born and raised, but I uh, moved around. The, the, I lived in Alberta, is where I met my uh, wife. Lived okay. in Tofino for a few years, and then I've been here for about ten years. Um, but my life uh, changed, flipped me upside down when I had my uh, my first uh, my first child, my daughter, uh, four years ago, five years ago, and uh, it totally made me think about life completely different, you know, way different. Uh, and that's how I got to work in healthcare. Uh, I was a project manager before, so when I jumped into healthcare, I immediately took on a project manager role. Um, and how can I, how can I, in any way, shape, or form, better British Columbia? And I couldn't think of any other way other than working for healthcare. And now, when I'm, uh, I currently work for BC Cancer, which makes me feel even better. Mm. Um, but when I started seeing what's what's my future right now, and then when I become a, a dad, now I, I can't be selfish and I think, well, what's my kid's future? And I look at Vancouver, and then I look outside of Vancouver. Victoria, so no forth, everywhere I go. But specifically, when I look at Vancouver, we're in trouble. Um, I we have to pay, I have to pay rent, food, daycare, I have to drive, find parking, and so on and so forth. And uh, we're we're barely making by. We're barely making by. So I'm a bit of an aggressor. That's what I'm known for. And I thought, you know what? Let's be aggressor provincially. I ran in the uh, provincial election versus Adrian Dix and the uh, 
Vancouver Kingsway. Okay. And now I thought, let's let's get into the municipal elections. And that's where our party decided, let's expand. Let's expand to municipalities as well. Um, we're tired of the media not giving us attention, so let's, let's force it. Okay. Yeah, we'll get into the yeah. media part of this, too, because, um, as I said in the intro here, there, there has been a perception about nobody wants this job. <laughs> nobody wants... Um, maybe we'll get into the legacy of Gregor Robertson, but some have, some have said he has left us a mess that we that nobody wants to clean up. And the big names, uh, George Allen or Bruce Allen, sorry, George Affleck, uh, Shanter Herbert, uh, have so far said no, but that could possibly change going forward. Um, why? What's your perception on what has? been said first of all from like nobody wants this job and maybe the coverage so far of the mayor race here in vancouver well with regard to coverage there's nothing new that i'm not used to uh it's it's we're non-existent right by pp which is we've been around for eight years but there's no coverage for us right Right. so i i get it they're not going to cover us even though the information is there um, but people have been throwing their hats in the ring and, uh, you know, they're, when they have no exposure, I mean, you're controlling who gets these votes because you're, you're the media, you're supposed to be giving out this information. And then we talked about this earlier and that's yeah. where you come in, which is amazing. Um, but it, it really, it really puts a, uh, a strain on anybody else who's trying to come in to make a difference. And you're going to get the big, you know, quote unquote, big players that might not have the right um, mindset or uh, care for Vancouverites to come in. They might be big names with big money, um, but does that mean that they're, they're going to do the right thing for people? But the media will take to them, right? right. But to your point, I, I really feel that uh, uh, the big players are trying to come in. Like look at Don, uh, who is the uh, MP for uh, Vancouver Kingsway NDP. He was initially coming in to run for mayor uh, for Vision, and then he, uh, he bailed out. Um, you're going to accept a dumpster fire of a city coming mm-hmm. in here. And I understand that. And as a, you know, as a project manager, our main thing as a P, uh, project manager is that you accept all responsibility. And for every, um, uh, for every success, you give it to the people who helped you. Right. Um, so we're coming in. I understand that. I understand my name might get hurt because I need to take a big, I need to accept all the errors that Gregor has done because now I'll be in that seat. Right. Right. Tell us about your party. Tell us about your history, what you guys bring to the table, what's the difference between you, Vision Vancouver, and NPA? We're not, I don't, never put ourselves on a a Richter scale of left or right. Uh, Right. We still don't. Uh, What it is, is essentially, it's an action. We we take action for what is, what is current, it's a balance, essentially. We need to understand where, where is it, is out of balance? Housing is out of balance. Homelessness is out of balance. Uh, we can, the list goes on right now. Uh, we need to rebalance everything. We need to focus ourselves on housing. We need to focus ourselves on homeless. We, you know, we need to put our efforts in. And once that's fixed, then we rebalance whatever else needs to be balanced. I mean, there's always going to be, it's always a balancing act. There's always something where that needs attention, right? Right. So that's why I don't, you can't just be one way. Right? You've got to constantly adjust. Right. How have you guys adjusted? Like you said, you maybe talk a little bit about your experience running with against Adrian Dix, and how is that kind of how is your strategy kind of come into play here and being part of the city election so, so far? I'm going to be more uh, more aggressive. Um, I called out Adrian and the NDP several times over because during debates, I shook my head when they kept saying ten dollar day daycare. Uh, they, they promised so much that I, and I knew that they cannot afford that. And, and if you're in 16 years of opposition and you can't figure out you can't afford that, there's a problem. Hmm. And I was standing up shouting, you cannot afford this. Don't lie. Don't. And you're going to catch yourself. And sure enough, they get elected. And what happens? Uh, many of their promises have fell right through the cracks. Hmm. And. But that's OK, though, for right. It, it seems like the media and everybody else. Is, but that's OK, because you can promise and get elected and not follow through and nothing happens. Nothing happens. There's a, there's a honeymoon phase, I think. Uh, even so, but it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to go to jail. You're not going to get in trouble for it. You might not get it reelected. Right. But then they're going to rebrand themselves as a new, 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 new NDA. Yeah. And then sure enough, you know, we made mistakes. We're going it, to, it is just a constant circle of, of, you know, forgive my language. It's just crap. Right. It's just garbage. So what I'm going to do next is really call out the NDP. I'm uh, sorry, the NPA. 
I'm going to call out Vision. I'm even going to call the other parties that are planning on collaborating, like Hope and One City and the, the Greens. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I mean by honeymoon is, and I'm not, I, I think you're right. I think in a lot of ways, we, there's sort of this, you know, everyone's trying to play the middle and we don't really want to push too hard and we want to give the NDP that chance. And, and being from Alberta and just moving out here two and a half years ago, I, I can say that from a different perspective because the Alberta NDP was a new party. We, okay, they're going to have some communication issues, this, that, and the other thing. But there's a point when, you know, in in our case here, there's a 16 years of being in opposition. There's some sort of accountability that has to be put in front. And we, you know, since I've been here, the Christy Clark was put under accountability. And I think what, what I'm hearing you say is, it's time to criticize and challenge some of the things that Horgan and the NDP are doing provincially. Yeah, and with no fluff. With no yeah, fluff. With no fluff. And, and you look at the the Alberta NDP, I mean, they, they campaign on the no Kenya Morgan, and then look what happened, right? Right. I mean, there's no fluff around it. You need to be aggressive. And I'm not going to stand up there and pat each other on the back. I'm going to be, I'm going to be aggressive. Okay. So let's talk about Mayor Gregor Robertson. Let's start there, and sure. then we'll get into some of your, mm-hmm. your platforms. I'm going to read... Um, something here is uh, from a Vancouver magazine called how will history mayor uh, remember mayor Gregor Robertson. There's a picture of him on a bike, which it's been well known. Um, he, this, I'm just going to read these, these two paragraphs quickly and just kind of get your thoughts on this. The mayor was more confident and articulate when he had the floor at council in international meetings of green cities and the forums of the like-minded, but most people never saw that. Instead, what they mostly saw was a mayor who seemed uncomfortable in his own skin, who often hid hid behind a wall of canned news releases from his office, and who had his tough lieutenants, Penny Ballam and Mike McGee. And so in the era of combative and sometimes fact-free Twitter, we'll get into that, he became the mayor who was in the pocket of big developers, who had a bike lane put in near his house to increase its value, (laughs) who was directly responsible for the streets not being plowed of snow, in brackets, another mayor in the region recently said to me, quote, when they start to blame you for the snow, it's time to leave. He still is admired by many, especially for the green initiatives, the op- of opposition of the Kinderberg pipeline, the dogged approach of trying to improve the city's housing options. We don't hear much from these people these days. They're drowned by the ones angry over other issues. What, if I was to say, what, what did Gregor, you said that the city is in a dumpster fire. What, what what was some of the things that Mayor Roberts has done right, and where do we need to start fixing? Although there's some things that you're, we're going to say they're pretty obvious here, but yeah, you know the the snowfall. I think it was two or three years ago. I mean, yeah, it's a bit of a cheap shot to him. He could he could have got the trucks out faster, but you know we can let that those type of things slide. But where has he failed? And you know you mentioned you know the, the green initiative. Yeah, he worked really closely with the, the green councilor Adrian Carr, but he wasn't as green. He built bike lanes, great, fine, parks, fine, but he wasn't building any of the new buildings. They weren't for um, for future state being proactive to really be green for those buildings. And he was, and he still is in the developers' pockets. There's no doubt about that. I was waiting, waiting to speak with Adrian, uh, Adrian Carr. And why I was there, three developers were coming to meet with uh, Louis, one of the vision counselors. And I just shook my head like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, these guys are deep in these pockets, right? Uh, but the biggest problem that he had is I don't, I don't, th- I think he's hard of hearing. I really feel that he doesn't have uh, the proper hearing because he could have many people come up and talk at city, uh, city hall and state, you know, here's a problem. And right, let's get the Airbnb. Right. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Yeah. There's more more people that were against uh, putting uh, regulations behind and just keep it legal. And what did they do? They, they didn't hear at all. And uh, Mayor Gregor and Vision just said, great, perfect, we're good. Um, we'll make a right, we'll regulate Airbnb. And he fell right into the hands of the Airbnb Corporation, who it baffled me by, I can't believe the, what they were lying about and saying that they're going to they're gonna help regulate it. It was just ridiculous. They can't. Um, that's that type of stuff where he doesn't listen to the public. He listens to what his corporations do. He's going to listen to what he feels best for, for, um, Vancouver, which is not, I think he lost his vision. That's where I say, it's, you know, it's a blurred vision, not right. vision Vancouver. Um, the biggest thing is that, you know, just look at, like I said, Airbnb, when there's 7,000 illegal Airbnbs and you're not giving any of them tickets 
and there's only 1,000 rental units available, there is a clear problem when you can increase you know, 700% for the actual uh, rental vacancy period. Um, it's hard. It's hard because that's just one of many stories that is an absolute failure. Okay. Yeah. So what would you do? What do you want to see done with Airbnb? Unfortunately, I would. What I would like personally like to see is just getting them out of Vancouver completely. You have a you have a place outside of the, of the bigger cities. Absolutely, you have a place. We have hotels in the city. Okay. Right. People go should go to the hotels. Right. Um, and for some cases where you can't actually rent your suite, okay, let's talk about it. I mean, we maybe can give out a, how x amount of licenses, and then let's really get the public out there to find these these people who are renting six places and putting them in an Airbnb. Let's find these people. And let's give them a finder's fee when you do it. And we're gonna tax, we're gonna fine them out the you know forgive me the tax them out of the ass right. We're gonna make sure that we charge them heavily. Um, I'd like to see it gone. Uh, I don't trust the company. Uh, the organization has sued San Francisco. There's problems everywhere. Uh, lots of problems. Uh, but I'd like to see them gone. I mean, even when the uh, the, the speaker I'm trying to think of actually her name uh, for Airbnb organization in Canada, she was saying that. Uh, we can regulate it and we can put a, a regulation number so you can see that you're you're actually um that you actually have a license for an airbnb in vancouver and we'll just put a text field up there and there's no there's no way to go and check to see if that's actually true someone can just put in 1506 there you go there's my there's my number and it might not be true right there's no way to actually verify that now there would be some people that would say that Airbnb is is a better option than some of the hostels and hotels here in Vancouver, uh, because of cost, because of safety, because of privacy, um, a lot of other things. What would you say to that? So safety is it safer to go, do an Airbnb than a hotel? Uh, I haven't personally done an Airbnb, so I can't necessarily say that. I always when I move when I was moving here. I always stayed at the Robson on Y, the Y on Robson there, not on Robson, but the Y on Robson, just for the record. Uh, and I found that to be a great, great place. Uh, very private, very clean, very respectable, close to everything. Um, now that place is always full. Not that I care now cause I live here, but, um, I mean, I have, I've heard some people in Airbnb that have Airbnb and are, have a immaculate, uh, service and there's been some places that unfortunately are scams that's mm -hmm. happened here too mm -hmm. um we'll get into some rental we'll get into the rental discussion here too but um there's some some people that are finding airbnb as a very valuable tool in a tourist city like vancouver yeah but let's talk about vancouver let's talk about who's gonna run for mayor right right what is the mayor who's the mayor work for they work he works for vancouver rights, right right so airbnb is convenient for tourists fine okay. Hotels okay. are there, right? Yeah. But when you start reducing heavily, like slashing um, rental units available for Vancouver rice and that prices go up heavily, then you're actually, you're, you're hurting Vancouver rice. So then you have to jump in and say, I need to defend my Vancouver rice. I need to defend them. I need to make sure that they're not paying an arm and leg for rent. So we see Airbnb as a problem. We need to do something. Cut them out. Okay. Let the prices drop. I'm focused on Vancouver's. I'm not focused on the tourists. They're okay. going to come. You want to come over here? That's fine. You might have to pay a little extra for the hotel. Okay. Okay. And most people do anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, what about Uber? Since we're on the, uh, what are your thoughts on Uber? Come on in. Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And give it, a, you know, give it a try. Um, I think, you know, we have, we already have, uh, you know, pick up the car to go and so on and so forth. But you know, I, I don't find that uh, you can rely on taxis as much, really. There's always that problem with taxis. And um, we, you know, I think especially the government works too much, too closely with the taxis. I think we should open that market up. Absolutely, Uber should be should be a, a good one to go through. And, you know, you, you play it out, and it's trial and error. But um, I think, yeah, let it in. Okay. Have you been following kind of some of the city's resistance to Uber? Uh, no, not not closely. No. Okay. No, it hasn't been a big thing on my uh, on my radar at this time. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, back to renting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I moved here, it was it was really fascinating. Sort of the aggressiveness and sort of the high expectation of people to like you got to make a decision like right now, mm -hmm. uh, and because that was the way that the market ended up being, um, and I was fortunate to find a place. But it's 
it's really hard for a lot of people to find something really reasonable, especially here in Vancouver where you're paying $800 to live in a closet. Literally, yeah, a closet. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not lying. Everyone knows that. I'm not lying. It's actually, I actually, it was a closet. Um, and so what do we need to do to start breaking this down for allowing people, residents of Vancouver, which you want to defend, to rent here in Vancouver? How, what's... Talk about some solutions that you have about the housing. Yeah. Yes. I'm just I'm just worried that how many are gone? How many are still here? I mean, 10 years ago when I came here, I rented a place on uh, Main and 49th. And when I was here, it was it was 11, a two-bedroom. Yeah. Uh, and it was a, almost 1,000 a square feet. And it was, it was 1185 a month. And within two months, they didn't do any much res- ren- renovations to it. And they said, no one would feel bad. We were supposed to do more. And this is actually a, a big building. And they reduced it by $50. So it's eleven thirty-five. Okay, you you don't you don't see that anymore, and you know we never see it go down. Um, so how what happened? You came here two and a half years. What happened in that eight years? That seven and a half years? Um, and if you think, and actually this is Hector Bremer from MPA, so it is not the the foreign investments coming in here. That's that's the problem. We just need to keep building more. We need to increase the supply, and I I don't agree with that. I, I agree with yeah, we, we need do need more supply, but I, there's empty homes. I mean, right. And this is, I got in a fight with, uh, with, uh, George Affleck, um, on, uh, Twitter because he was saying there's 95% uh, of the homes are actually vacant. And then sure enough, there's, uh, somebody who was actually running a business. A few people were running businesses to actually do a little loophole to let that out, to let that say, you know what, well, we actually have people living here, so we're not going to pay the empty home tax. It's not empty. Uh, there's so many empty homes. And I think we should actually make sure that we, we increase the taxes. We make sure that if it's empty home tax. And I think I stated that is that if you don't pay your empty home tax and you truly are a foreign investor is that if you don't pay it for two years and it's a he- I want to increase it heavily, like tenfold. Really? You know, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't pay the empty home tax and we can repossess it and put it at an auction, right? That's what they do in the city right now. Okay. And, uh, that's, there's one of many things, uh, around ensuring that the empty home tax has no loopholes. Um, they're not going to rank. And this is the same thing with Gregor and his vision, field vision, blurred vision team is that they just didn't, they didn't follow through with anything. When you put a regulation in, you know, follow through with it, you know, really put it out to people. And that's what I was saying too, is that, you know, don't just let the, the government call out anybody or do an investigation. People do the investigation. Look at Bistro for, uh, for Airbnbs. I mean, these people are finding the, all kinds of legal Airbnbs, but no, the city's not doing anything. We should be using these, uh, valuable resources and giving them a finder's fee and, t- and, and ticket these people heavily. So for those who don't know who he is, tell us a little bit about. Oh, yeah. Vistro has been an activist for the past few years. Um, he's been, he, he or she has been threatened so many times over. Um, and basically we're calling out uh, all the illegal Airbnb's because, you know, at one point in time, I think it's illegal now, I think as of November, but uh, for a long time, Airbnbs were illegal, and seven thousand of them were infesting our city, and nothing was done about it. So uh, there was a group of people that were fighting against this, and Vistro was one of them. Mm. Yeah, and we plan on um, speaking with Vistro this morning, and we plan on doing a lawsuit, uh, seeing what we can do for the city, and hopefully put a put a lawsuit together against Airbnb in Canada, and as well as um, the city. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about purchasing a house here, which is almost impossible um, <laughs> at this point in time? Like, unless, you know, even a millionaire can't at this point. Not really. No. What are what are some solutions you have to that? Then, you know, like I, was saying, I was saying before is that we, we're not, we have to be active. We have to be regressive, right? And we have to cut off supply to uh, investments. A home shouldn't be an investment. A home should be an investment to grow your kids, right? Your kids need somewhere to, to grow up. You shouldn't own four or five houses or three, or four, you know, whatever the case is. That is supposed to be for your kids to grow up. That is supposed to be for Vancouver, right? I don't even think it is as British Columbia. And I agree with Andrew Weaver. It's just, just increase the foreign tax, 30, 40%. You know, make sure that it's British Columbians. Make sure it's Vancouver, right? To have the first dibs at a place, right? Because uh, oftentimes, you find these actual private sales being flipped offshore three or four times before it even comes to our market, right? Um, mm. And I'd definitely put a stop to that heavily. Yeah. Is it is it house specifically that's the cost, or is it the land that people are paying for? Do you know? 
you know, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> it's just, just it's don't so insane. Anything. It's it's gone. It's gone out of control. I, I I wouldn't even know where to begin anymore. It is the land. It's the house. It's just location. It's it's just a place. Any place in almost British Columbia. I think all of British Columbia. It's just there's there's weightness to you, you go in and just to buy a place and um, it's frustrating. Yeah. Frustrating. Yeah, even when I was renting here, and one of the things I remember is I, I got a call from an apartment. I was living in Calgary, and it said, "Can you come in with in two hours?" I'm like, "I live in Calgary. It's not. It's not possible. <laughs> you know that." And they were like shocked, but sort of the I don't know. There's an expect. I feel like there's an expectation that just people are made of money, in some senses here. They are. Well, they are, and it, it was a the you know, Bank of Canada. Is, you know, our our current banks are just. Here's here's an interest rate that is so low. I remember when I was at one point in time when I first moved here, I wasn't making a great deal of money by any means, but I got approved for a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, and I just remember thinking, I can't afford, I can't afford the mortgage on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they just give you money. I mean, here, hmm. and uh, I think what we're going to find is that when you, these interest rates are, I've been going up, and when you get to renew those interest rates, we're people are in trouble, big trouble. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the other concerns I think that's coming out of that is there there hasn't been one in a while, but there has been the Dear Vancouver, I love you, but I'm leaving you mm-hmm. letters. And it's it's from the millennials. Mm-hmm. It's from the younger people um, finding that this area in the city is not affordable, as beautiful as it is. It's not a place that people can necessarily spend the rest of their life with a family for. So they're moving out. How or what are some of the things that we can do to kind of keep that here? And are you afraid like anyone else that this, the city is going to become uh, sort of a, this transition town that the perception is only going to be a certain generation, the older generation is going to be here, uh, not the younger, but we're losing the younger voices of Vancouver. What are your thoughts on that? It's it's already like that. Uh, we're losing younger generations uh, every day. So we, I almost wrote a letter too. See you later. Um, what kept you here? Healthcare, mm. specifically. Uh, yeah, healthcare. Yeah, I mean, I could do it somewhere else, but um, it's just been great. It's been great. And my wife too. She has a great job here. Uh, our daycare. It's really hard. I love my daycare provider. I couldn't imagine going somewhere else. It's it's tough. I mean, it's a big, big decision, especially when you have kids. It's big. Um, But rent, I mean, when it comes down to it, you need to open that rental market. You need to reduce the rent. And that would keep people in. You know, younger people, they might not be able to afford a house, but let's let them afford rent. Right. So they can be here. We need that. If not, we're going to be a dead city. What happens when you don't have the youth to help you grow? Then you're going to be a dead city. Right. Right. Yeah. The most beautiful, unpopulated city <laughs> yes, in the world, in Canada. There's nobody here, but we love it. Yeah. Uh, let's go through some other issues that um, are on your, your platform here. Let's talk about the opioid crisis. Mm-hmm. And you've talked about a, you talk about a tech detection toolkit. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I was working with a, a few people within healthcare, and there's a, the, the type of de- uh, detection toolkits that uh, you can just de- determine that how with the potency of these opioids, whether or not it's going to be dangerous and you know so on and so forth because oftentimes someone would buy these type of drugs and wanting a specific high and they didn't realize how the potency of it and then yeah dying um these these kits are fairly uh, inexpensive and why can't we have them easily accessible at libraries and uh you know lending drugs shoppers so on and so forth just be be there in this way if you're gonna use at least test it first make sure you're not going to go into some sort of um spiral and end up getting hurt hmm. um kind of what are your you what what is some of the solutions or uh, other than detection what are kind of you seeing with the opioid crisis which is by the way the thing that i think so people have been pretty critical on gregor robertson about but it, his defenders would say that he has at least brought it up as a conversation that we're now talking about it but it's it's becoming a really huge issue and not just air quote, the homeless folk. It's mm-hmm. the you and I folk that are dealing with a lot of this as well. Yeah. Uh, well, he, he's now bringing, he's been warned for you know, a decade, but uh, he's only now talking about this. Open it up before I go. Let's talk about it. Um, it's a tough one to bring. I know a lot of times too, it's hard times. People go to these uh, type of drugs and 
uh, we just got to make sure that people, if they're going to do it, let's make it safe. Let's make sure we have the uh, the proper tools to get them off of it if they are now addicted. You know, there's there's great uh, ways to, if you have a doctor, and this is the hard part, if you have a doctor, you can actually go to get a prescription, go to the shoppers and actually get the type of, um, uh, it's a type of liquid that takes away the cravings for this, uh, op- these type of opioids. Um, it's so hard to actually get that doctor to get that prescription. Making it a little bit easier uh, to get that going would be would be better, but that's more of a provincial level. Uh, the only thing we can do, uh, you know, anybody who else wants to go on the website and add in your comments, please, because I would love to actually, and this is a collaboration. I'm not going to build my policies around uh, just what I think. You know, this is where I think the subject matter experts, and if you feel that you are in healthcare, come in and add in those um, policies. But I feel that... Uh, there's not as much as a city can do as a province can do. I think provinces can do more. Um, but as a city, I think uh, I need to assess exactly what are my options that I can deal with. But and at that time, other than that, what I have for the, the toolkit detection and making sure that uh, they have that ready available, that's what I have so far. Okay. Okay. And so something you're certainly open to other ideas of. Um, have you felt that the city has done a like graded at a one to 10, I think it's pretty hard to do that. Have you been impressed with what the city's trying to do? Or is this just something that's just, it's almost impossible to really get a handle on at this point. It's hard to say because it's been spiraling out of control. Uh, who's to blame for it? I, I don't know if I, I couldn't really put a number on it. I don't know, but I'm really keen to speak with like the nurses union um, and more, more healthcare people to see, you know, what, what are you experiencing? Like, what's that, what's been actually happening? What, what do you think that it could help? And, um, especially when I was talking to some people at London Drugs and Shoppers Drug Mart, the pharmacists there, then those would be key resources to figure something out. Okay. Uh, talk about, because you talked about subject matter experts. So talk about your relationship with Adrian Carr and, of course, about um, environmental and green initiatives that you kind of want to, I, I like what you're saying because you're you're not an expert on this, and you're not certainly not going to overrule a, a legend like Adrian Carr in any environmental <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Neither no, am I. <laughs> I mean, I recycle. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm as green as I can be in Vancouver, um, which is which is a lot, which is great. We're a green city, but um, when it comes to talking about green policies, I mean. I'm not going to talk. Adrian Carr is going to destroy me. Uh, you know, Pete Fry. That's another who's going to run for who ran in by election, and also is going to be running in the the, ne- the next election coming up. Um, so I sat down with Adrian and I said, um, you know, what, there's no point for me to create these policies that will likely be similar to yours because I'm just going to feed off yours. So can can I endorse your policies for the green green side of the community side of our platform? And she said, absolutely. And um, you know, I have it right on the page saying that she agreed to it. Uh, I linked to the Green Party's platform um, as a Green Party. And this is where I was talking to with the collaboration for the other parties is that, you know, is Adrian going to run for mayor? That's one of the things I was stressed. And, you know, it's a Green Party and they're focused on the green initiatives. There's a problem to really expand to all the policy, uh, everything that can fix Vancouver when you're just focused on green. Mm-hmm. So I think she's insanely valuable she's an amazing individual um so i'm happy to to adopt that policy and work with her okay. especially Pete fry is a he's a great great person okay okay so again one of those things we're we're going to develop work with some people and i'll be looking at if let's say if i were to be elected i'll be looking for all green policies that are coming up i'll be looking for directions from the green party okay all right uh you have a street or in your community platform, you have a street art providing grants for small business, small to mid business owners who wish to hire an artist and paint a positive image, reasonable, non offensive on the outside walls. Talk a little bit about your street art. Yeah. yeah when, I, when I officially uh, originally moved to, on Main Street, um, it was, it was uh, developing in, in a way of being a culture, a cool place to be. And I love Main Street. I love, love Main Street. Um, I like the coffee shops, the places, the patios. Um, if you look at the buildings, they have great artwork now. Just slowly but surely, all these like blank slated buildings now have these great pieces of artwork. And it really brings the city to life. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, in a way of getting some grants for our art students or to, you know, help them out in any way, or even that artist, um, you know, if, if they can get hired to paint this beautiful thing on a wall, like a beautiful picture on the wall, I mean, why not subsidize that? It's just only going to make our, our city look better. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. And I, of course, um, 
anything that can grant an artist an opportunity to create mm-hmm. some work. Um, and as much as Vancouver has this perception of being an artistic city, it's still tough here to be an, oh, yeah. an artist and a creative. I mean, there's a great vibe, but it's also very competitive in a lot of mm-hmm. ways too. So getting any edge in that is... Yeah. I think that opened some doors. And can you imagine walking down commercial and Main Street and almost every building had some sort of painting on it? It'd be great. Yeah, would be great. Be yeah. Uh, some other things that you talk about... Um, um, is donating $60,000 every year in office to fund food for Vancouver homeless? Yeah. Um, there's a, a, I'm trying to think of where it says once, once in, uh, Gene Swanson works for our volunteers for this organization that, uh, uh, has very, uh, cheap, I guess, I don't want to say cheap, but inexpensive, uh, food that you know, the homeless can go to. It's downtown right, around Chinatown and they can go in and have uh, an inexpensive meal. Right? Um, since the the mayor makes 165000 plus a little bit extra, um, I thought it's that's a big greedy. It's a lot. That uh, I'll donate 60000 of that, and that would help um, pay for... Uh, I worked with the numbers to hopefully pay for breakfast um, uh, four or five days a week for the homeless. Oh. Um, that's my way of giving back. Um, and also, too, when I was running against Adrian Dix, I was willing to donate 25% of my income to uh, the community centers within Vancouver Kingsway. Okay. Yeah. So that's been our, our initiative to, to give back to the community. Okay. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but um, uh, host community meetings once a week at City Hall and available online for open discussion about current policies. I guess the first question is, is, is I'm going to assume an answer here, but I'm going to let you say it anyway. Mm-hmm. Have you found City Hall to be in any way uh, available online for open discussion about current policies? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that laughter is the answer in and of itself. Uh, I can, I've been there and I waited my line and turn, turned in the line and spoke. And then, I don't think people are paying attention. I just think they just, they're completely ignoring everyone um so I, I think it'd be nice to you know as much as i can really to be live on facebook and twitter and have a couple of people monitoring so they can answer some questions mm-hmm. and um why not just be there on for in person and just talk and then to get if whoever is getting elected counselor do the same thing yeah you know, come on let's just talk about it anybody come on talk yeah it should be i, I know i'd be using the word should but it, i mean it would seem to be a good recommendation to at least have a like a facebook town hall some sort of town halls that people can kind of see what's going on mm-hmm. because i i sense that the lack of your engagement as a politician is because of not yours specifically but yeah. the lack of engagement from city hall to people is why people don't vote because you obviously don't care enough about me to participate in this conversation why should i vote for anyone because you're not going to change anything anyway. What happens, the sun or the rain is going to come out Monday or Tuesday. And whoever is there doesn't matter. So I think mm-hmm. creating that relationship is really important. I just, can you imagine, like, you're developing policy for people. Why not listen to the people? Like, it's no brainer. I don't understand why you haven't done it. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, turn the mayor's office from a secured locker room to a kid-friendly <laughs> space to accommodate speakers with children. <laughs> Talk about that. That's interesting. If you ever go and uh, you've ever spoken to the all, no, I haven't yet. No, <laughs> everyone's crowded into a room, and, and you have a, you're waiting for your your uh, your number to be called to, to speak. And there's mayor's office, which is like locked up, and you have to have a key and you get in, and so on and so forth. And there's really nothing. They sometimes they come up with like a jug of water and maybe like five cups for a hundred people. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to tear that door down. Just tear it down. And these those kids are crying because their parents need to come and talk and they really are passionate about talking, but you know, they have to bring their kids and just make it a kid friendly place. I mean, I, I I'm okay with working out in the hallway and make it a kid go in there, lounge, relax. If you want to come talk, great, but I want you to be comfortable before you come and talk. Right. 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 And yeah. That, that's the idea. Yeah. I mean, if you if you walk in I, every time I walk into City Hall, I yawn. Like it is the most boring and depressing place to be. And let's not let's make it a little more fun, more kid friendly, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have a pinball machine or something. Uh, green beer? Uh, maybe not the green beer. What? I'll have it today, though. Okay, fair. Enough. <laughs> We're recording this on St. Patrick's Day, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
and, and simply do the right thing. Let's talk about a couple quickly about a couple of other issues that kind of came to the forefront this week or last uh, as, and maybe talk about some of the other people that you're expecting to kind of jump in a little bit. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the mayor should be like. So the three more quick things here. Uh, where are we going here? Do you have a thought about the, the FIFA situation? Uh, for those who don't know, Vancouver is basically not part of the North American bid for the World Cup. Now, there's some people that are like, you know what, it was a really, it's a terrible decision, uh, really irresponsible on the NDP's part. The other people are saying, you know what, it's actually kind of prudent. Uh, Chicago, Minnesota, and the Alberta government actually is not going to fund Edmonton's bid in this, interestingly mm-hmm. enough. So where are you at? Or have you, do you have thoughts on that? Or is it just... Uh... I I would have loved to watch FIFA live. I'm a big FIFA fan. I, I wish I could... I would love to see Germany playing with Tang, the yeah. defense play in there, and the Brazilian team. I, I would love to actually see all that, but uh, they are hard to deal with. And if you look at any city they've ever been in, they're not... Nothing good comes from having them there, other than just glorifying your city a little bit more than what it, what it was the day before. Um, if anything, it's going to do more harm to the city. Um, so I'm, I'm glad they're not going to be here, but I'm sad at the same time I don't get to watch live games. I mean, I've always wanted to go somewhere that's hosting FIFA. I wouldn't want to be in my backyard, though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There has been some questions about the ethics of FIFA, and yeah. that keeps coming up. Um, so, yeah, that's... The other story that happened is uh, Premier Horgan and the governor from Washington has talked about a transit sort of idea from Vancouver to down actually potentially to Oregon. No. I don't know why he's doing that. That's ridiculous. Really? Yeah. It's just so much money. <laughs> <laughs> we already have our transit issues within our own province. Uh, let alone just trying to trying to get to Victoria. I mean, we get these old boats that are going across, and you know we don't have our current infrastructure right now for trying to. You know, it's good, but why build? Why spend so much money to go into the states when you have a new high speed rail? You know, sure, maybe farther down, but let's let's fix what we have. Okay. Yeah, or add add to the existing what we have now because we already have a housing issue. Right. And people have to travel hours just to get to work. I mean, let's make it a little bit easier for our people first, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's. Uh, you brought up transit. Anything you would change on that? On transit? Yeah. What about twenty four hour service? Oh, for oh yeah no I, I understand they did a study on uh, how much more money would it be but I remember when I was when I came here when my wife and I didn't have kids and we would go out at night and. <laughs> I remember uh, we would go until two in the morning and in the bar shot or one thirty in the morning, whatever the case is. And I mean, some the, the station is closed. How do you get home? And then let's rely on the taxi. Yeah, that's not the best either. Right. I mean, you get a at least maybe not twenty four hours, but extend it. Yeah. Definitely extend it. Extend it. You know, yeah. maybe maybe close to twenty four hours, twenty hours or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, who is you mentioned Hector Bremner? Yeah. You are in this. We had this perception that there was just nobody going to be in it. Uh, who are kind of some of the other names to watch for in this mayor race? Well, we have uh, Wang Young, who was initially going to run for mayor uh, for MPA, who's now running uh, on her own uh, as, a, I guess, an independent mayor. Uh, she, ran, she was elected a conservative, so she was a hard Harper Stephen Harper uh, fan and uh, supporter, uh, and you know Vancouver loves that there's Stephen Harper. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's right beside the monument. It's right beside City Hall there. Yeah, <laughs> and then of course and you got Hector Bremner, who, who is he's not running. He's, he's putting his bid in. You know, there's right. Glenn Turnin right now is also putting his bid, but it's highly likely Hector Bremner is going to take that spot. And uh, <laughs> I mean. When I look at this, because I have, you know, Way on one side, who is a Harper supporter, and then I have Hector Bremner, who is, his lips were so tightly sealed around um, uh, Christy Clark's ass. Like, it is just, it's uh, uncanny that you're going to, uh, you're going to vote for uh, Christy Clark, who pretty much ruined our province, or Stephen Harper, who pretty much ruined our country. <laughs> and then I'm coming in here, and then the media is not going to pay any attention and say, oh, whatever, we'll just see, we'll take Garbage in, garbage out. Which let's just grab another one of these 
um, career career politicians that apparently know what they're doing. Um, I mean, it's upsetting actually just to even see that these people are coming to to the show, and I'm glad. I mean, I'm really looking forward to tearing them a, a new quote unquote, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess maybe what do you what are you hoping that the media does in terms of the coverage? Like when I I hope to be interviewing everybody else, all the mayor candidates and get really invested in this conversation a little bit more. But what are you hoping in terms of the media coverage on this? Like and don't worry, I'm a podcast. I'm not affiliated with anybody. I, no, I, no, no, I'm not afraid of any. It's yeah, so fun. Um, I, I get I get my own threats for yeah. <laughs> um You know, it, it's not a hard thing. It's something that we've been working towards for a long time. But it's you know, it's let's give equal attention, right? Equality, equal attention. I don't care if this one person's coming in and he's not as well known or she's not mm-hmm. as well known. Let's give some equal attention to everybody, right? Let's not put a big picture of Hector Brimner and then down below we can put a couple more people's names, right? I mean, you know, you know what side you're taking when you do that right and then you're being you're not really actually being the media because you're not really presenting the information to the public in an equal way right right okay uh, so that's not going to happen unfortunately but that's what uh, i think we should be pushing for as people right let's not be brainwashed and you know and then, then we also have the the countless of uh you know blood money that's been stolen i've been taken from corporations and used against uh people who i you know i don't i'm running off my own budget it's, it's not easy i don't i'm not going to accept money from people to run right. this right yeah right um you know one of the things i'm willing to do if you find one of these mayor candidates i'll do a debate between you and one of them and i'll sit as a moderator i'll put that out to anybody that's wanted to be a mayor candidate in this race I'll be the moderator. You bring two or three of you in here. We'll have a dialogue about some of the issues and get all your perspectives in there. You know, I'm, I, I would love it. Yeah, I would love it. And it would be great too is uh, to get all these, uh, you know, what quote unquote progressive parties that are looking to collaborate. Uh, that'd be nice to actually get them to speak actually truly. See, are you looking to collaborate too? And that'd be uh, one of the good, one of a great podcasts. Well, a great debate. But uh, I'm willing. I you know called out uh, Greg Affleck and he didn't. Uh, he didn't respond to it after our back and forth on Twitter. Um, so if anybody wants to do a debate in any way, shape, or form, I'm, I'm here, and I'm glad that you're going to host that. Yeah, it's called <laughs> Agree or Disagree, the podcast, for a reason. So let's <laughs> let's do that. Uh, in terms of designing the mayor, like, it's, you know, what are the, the strengths or what are the qualifications that you want to see in this mayor? If it's not you... What, what are you hoping that we get as Vancouverites? Just somebody that listens to the people. And let's be fair. Um, don't take so much. You know, don't take anything. I mean, you're in this job. You're working for the people. Give back. I mean, you're working for, to better somebody's life. Um, just listen. Pay attention. And deliver. Okay. It's not hard. All right. Is there anything else we should talk about? Uh, no, I might have to get to go into the, uh, my uh, wife and two kids that are, da- that are downstairs at the moment. Okay. So we're done. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. No, I totally appreciate you coming out. Um, tell us a little bit where we can follow you and your website and mm-hmm. where is there times that we can meet you? Are you going to do a Facebook town hall? I, you know, closer to the date, I'm actually I'm taking off to Japan for uh, about a month. I'll be working from there as well. Um, uh, so I'll be off the scene for a bit. Um, but you can reach me on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, Twitter is usually the better bet. You know, I've only just started maybe a year, year and a half ago. But it's uh, uh, just Brett Mullins. I have spelled my name a little bit uh, in a different way. Um, B-R-E-T-T-E. Yeah, and it, there's a funny story behind that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so B R E T T E and then uh, M U L L I N S, and that's uh, at Twitter. Yeah. Okay, cool. And of course, you can follow me Facebook.com, K E V O L E, SoundCloud.com, K E V O L E, Speaker.com, K E V O L E, YouTube, uh, Kevin Olenek, Patreon, K E V O L E, Instagram, Like, Agree, or Disagree, the podcast on Facebook. Thanks for joining us, Brett, who's Thank on you. his phone. <laughs> As we <go>. I didn't... <laughs> no problem uh, thanks a lot and we will talk to you all very soon